we shall spend a fair hour tomorrow doing the same thing. So today, uh, I'm just going to deal with the preparation section of that poem. Uh, Robert will read it right the way through, and then I'm going to talk about it in uh, a sense or a general sense which I feel is essential if people are going to relate this poem to faith. The reality of the history of this country, in other words, in the light of the Buddhist teachings. So uh, it's taking this study a step further. Many of you will have been at the first session, which was during NSUK summer course, when I did my best to take it line by line and make sure we were all on the same wavelength. I heard afterwards that in no way were many of us on the same wavelength. <laughs> all sorts of people had difficulties and concerns about it. So I'm hoping that this session may take that uh, a step further and help people to really relate to it. Because to relate to it, we must. Until we can relate to it, there is something missing in our understanding of the relationship between daily life and faith. Because that's what this poem is really all about. So, uh, first of all, I'll ask Robert just to read through the preparation section only. Okay? Across the seven seas and beyond, toward the century of humanity, a poem to the members of NSUK by SGI President Daisaku Ikeda. I dedicate this poem to my dear friends of the country of gentlemen and ladies. The United Kingdom, once the Lord of the Seven Seas, embraced the majestic dream of the world as one. The vicissitudes of history did the stone walls of the Eternal City witness. Dignified houses in the outskirts sprawling, refreshing green lawns and countless flowers, brilliant evermore, and standing quietly, an ancient castle embraced in the tranquil forest. It is the beautiful country of Britain. Over land of gentlemen and ladies, simple and honest, yet dauntless are you, nature's close observer and guardian. Your refined dignity is the model for other nations. Hold your heads high, for the tradition of the parliamentary system itself is the fruit of your proud history. From the fetters of the old hierarch hierarchical system, your people with their own hands won freedom and democracy that was forged through storms of tribulations. It is the energy of the people's will continuously flowing, an undercurrent of the deeply rooted custom of debate and dialogue practiced in the parliament, its origin in the past. Trust in the people, dialogue with the people. Violence is defeat of humanity, discourse an expression of humanity. O oh, dialogue, the royal road to peace. It is the product of your nation's excellent wisdom. Here lies the testament that the pen is mightier than the sword. Behold this country to where the seeds of Buddhism travelled, planted themselves and sprouted. That was over 20 years past. O oh, admirable women and you, rooting deeply in this adopted home country through days of adversities did they engage in propagation. Young pioneers of the United Kingdom, though few in number, shared joys and sorrows, encouraging each other. Envisaging the day when the land, uncultivated after long years of hardship, is transformed into a garden bursting with flowers in full bloom. My precious dear friends, one by one have you been planting and nurturing the saplings of propagation. Friends united in one, the unbreakable bond of carefree hearts. 
You are, you are an ideal of solidarity for the world. A glorious moment in the history of Kosen Rufu. It was among the lovely flowers and verdure of London. Unforgettable dialogues with Dr. Arnold Toynbee. Your fervent devotion then forever do I cherish. Nor will I ever forget the discourse with your lives so fulfilled. Eyes both radiant and sincere. Songs talking to the depths of my heart. It was by the River Thames I recall so vividly. Even to this day in my heart resounds the appealing words that the aged great scholar pronounced. A religious conversion of the human mind, an emergence of some sort of a world religion to achieve a voluntary unity of humanity. For this very reason, my ladies and gentlemen, successors of your great cosmopolitan ancestors, inheriting the tradition of dialogue of the heart, have you expanded the forum to invite peace and happiness? My dear fellow members of the United Kingdom, I hold out my hand and send you my applause, for you yourselves are the valiant who in your heart embrace the perpetual emblem of splendour, the emblem of a true world citizen. Said one man, a British person thinks while he walks. Thought rooted in action and action rooted in thought. Action and thought are one and inseparable and indivisible, are they? Not accepting any thought to forsake action, unyielding to the deification of theory, system and efficiency, always contemplating the reality. <laughs> This temperament in itself is the mainspring of British empiricism. Free of prejudice are your views and thoughts. Assured behaviour of persistence and composure, which all reflect the self, an individual being. And I shown in rights, the 84,000 teachings are the diary of one's own life. The innumerable teachings of Shakyamuni Buddha all elucidate nothing else but an individual human life. The thinking of the Orient, the teachings of Buddhism above all, never do they depart from the subject of one's own life. For their essence means we should view everything that exists only in relation to the reality of oneself. Furthermore, Buddhism perceives deep down in each individual the pulsation of the universe permeating all phenomena, the basic law of the universe, individual and universal, part and whole, discriminate and indiscriminate, transient and perpetual, and microcosm and macrocosm. O oh, my dear friends of the United Kingdom, my precious comrades emerging from the earth, Though great past scholars and philosophers there have been, the transition from the individual to the universal, they failed to achieve. But to this you proceed valiantly, to behold the great sun in the east, high above, pouring its rays so warm and compassionate over the entirety, one and all. Oh, it is our mystic law, all fulfilling and embracing the cosmos in totality, shedding its light on life's true entity. It is the one and only fundamental law, the ultimate law of the middle way to attain a sublimation of the self, to awaken the greater self to the principle of the oneness of the self and universe. A person of the middle way is a person of good sense. A British adage states, reason lies between the spur and the bridle. It is the manifestation of people's wisdom. Wisdom, both simple and pertinent. We, runners on the middle way, discard the extremities of bias and the radical. As good citizens of your nation, be men of harmonious nature, advancing valiantly under the fluttering banner of sensible thinking.
Buddhism is the ultimate of all reason. And reason is another title for being sensible. Says the Daishonin, Buddhism is reason. Reason will win over your Lord. Lord implies power and authority. Reason is the cause for inspiration and conviction. Conduct of good sense. Language full of common sense. More than myriads of theories does this touch the hearts of people and open doors. This energy to inspire and convince them all defeats the Lord. Prejudice and ignorance does it also defeat. It is the best of all powers of persuasion. In one of Aesop's fables, a question is posed. Who is to cause a traveller to take off his coat? Is it the gust of north wind, or is it the warmth of the radiant sun? For this reason should we at all times be as this sun, always overflowing with vital force, always smiling, lively and refreshing, loved and admired, trusted by all. We are to be the people of good sense. Thank you very much, Robert. Um, that is preparation in terms of the, the three processes with which all uh, Buddhist teachings have been taught a preparation, revelation and transmission so we'll deal with transmission and we'll deal with revelation before it tomorrow but today let's prepare ourselves once more try hard to do so so in a way to do that I've got to try to paint a sort of picture for you all and for myself too none of us can possibly imagine what life was like in this country before World War I I think that's a fair bit. I don't think there's anyone here who, who could say that they really were old enough to remember life before World War I. But uh, certainly there are one or two, probably, including me, who can remember what life was like immediately after World War I, because that was when I was born. So I want to try and describe this to you, because in life after World War I was still the beliefs of life before World War I. And you must understand that these World Wars, I and II, were like a vast watershed in the life of humanity. Perhaps it's difficult to understand that. It was like someone tore a whole chapter out of a book and left a huge gap in the story of humankind. So life before World, One, World War I was founded on a rock. People believed this rock was as solid and indestructible as any rock you could find in the whole wide world. And the important thing to understand is that President Ikeda himself understands this. The reason he understands it is the education he was given by Mr. Toda. Probably Sensei is in fact better read in terms of the classics, not only of Britain, but also of other European countries, than any of us may be. He was made to read these classics, not just once, but often, over and over again. Sensei was, uh, Mr. Toda was educating him for life. So from Shakespeare on to the Brontes, for example, Dickens, Macaulay, 
Toynbee, and so on. Senses read them all. I soon realized a few years ago how uh, very lacking in really knowledge of the classics of my country I was compared to Sensei. So out of all these classics that he read, it became clear to him what was the driving force of the British people. And as I say, not only, please understand, we're talking about Britain specifically today, but also he did the same in France, with French literature and so on, in Germany, with German literature. He understood deeply as if you like, an outsider looking in can often get a very uh, correct view. It's the same with guidance, isn't it? We come to somebody with a problem. Why do we come? Because we feel that person is outside of the problem and can look in and get a balanced view. So Sensei is aware of the background of this country, probably better than many of us, in fact, because of this reading. So I was born, as you all know, I think now, in 1920. World War I had ended in 1918. And really, I was born into what to me as a small boy was a world of mourning. In every family, there were people in black. And people wore black for a long time in those days. In some families for a year, only in other families up to five years. And in some families, uh, mothers never ever got out of black until the day they died. So it reminded me when I was putting my notes down for this lecture of those lines. Unfortunately, I hadn't got volume two of the Gosho with me, but of those lines from the Risha Ankokoron, uh, that in every household someone grieved. There was a loss in every household. In every one of your families, in other words, there was a loss. It may have been the loss of a limb, or the loss of sight, or the loss of the ability to speak through poison gas, or it may have been the loss of someone killed. But whatever happens, Virtually, on the average, every family was in mourning. That was the world that I was born into. But at the same time, what Sensei calls the majestic dream lived on. I think uh, people found it impossible to take in, really, what had happened in a historic sense and what the effect of what had happened in that World War I would be in the future. The empire still existed, and people clung to it. And of course, as every year passed from World War I on towards World War II, gradually, uneasily, in an eerie way, people were beginning to realize that all that status, position in the world, power, strength, was actually disappearing. It was drifting away like uh, some flotsam and jetsam from a house that had suddenly been broken up by a great storm. So a generation had been slaughtered. A whole generation. Still, however, there was this extraordinary phenomenon of the empire on which the sun never set, as it was said, which spanned the entire world. And uh, still that attitude existed. I remember uh, going through my father's papers, some of you have heard me tell this before, but going through my father's papers and finding a letter which is a reply from a widow 
uh, to whom my father must have written uh, when her husband was killed in action. And she said in that letter, it's hard to believe that she said in that letter, please be assured, I shall always bring up my son to place God, king, and country first and to salute the flag. It's incredible, isn't it? It's language which is so completely out of date. It sounds as if, as if it's come from, you know, thousands of years ago. But that is what this lady wrote. And this was what people continued to cling on to. So let's look back a bit further at this thing called the British Empire. Because the British Empire affected everyone's lives. Whether you were spinning cotton in a factory in Lancashire, or whether uh, you were a businessman, whether you were a priest, whatever happens, the empire was there. So, its basis, people believed this, was justice. People believed the British Empire stood for justice. People believed that it stood for peace and security. People believed that it was based on Christian, true Christian morality. People believed that it permitted those in colonial territories or in dominions overseas uh, to live freely according to their culture and custom. And the interference in those cultures and customs was as minimum as possible. People never ever saw them, those people, as oppressed. They couldn't imagine that anyone could accuse them of oppression. They looked upon the people in the colonies and dominions as some of them children, some of them very young people growing up who needed guidance and direction. Of course, it was guidance and direction in the British way which was given to them and which they believed was the mission of Britain. So these vast territories were governed, in fact, through a civil service. A civil service consisting of actually tens of thousands, of course, considering the number of territories overseas. A civil service which I believe will go down in history as the most uncorrupt, the most pure, in its motivation, the most dedicated of any group of people, probably, that the world has seen until they began to know SGI. They really cared. It was a, per a parental form of jurisdiction. It was, in fact, of course, now we look back on it, overprotected. But it was these people, tens of thousands of them, who gave up their lives in the 19th century, in Victorian times, to live under extremely awful conditions often for a lifetime in order to give their lives to the peace and security and justice of the people who may serve. And it is from this that the old uh, maxim of noblesse oblige arose. Noblesse oblige means that if you have privilege in terms of the position you hold in society, it always and must entail responsibility. That is the meaning of noblesse oblige. 
And that is really the principle, the main principle on which these people were educated and developed and trained for the task they had. So this principle, of course, probably was only taught in the public schools and in the grammar schools. I don't think in the least it was taught generally throughout the education system. And of course, in another part of the poem where Sensei talks about Eton and Harrow, he's not suggesting that every, everyone should go to Eton and Harrow or that every school should be exactly like Eton and Harrow. Of course not. What he's saying is that the great good points, the principles of leadership, the principles of uh, uh, justice, and so on, which were taught in the public schools, you know, should be taught in all schools. Public schools are schools of privilege. No one wants schools of privilege. Grammar schools even were schools of privilege. No one wants schools of privilege. What we want, and what I'm sure our education group would like to see happen in the future, is for every school to be a school of privilege. In other words, everyone is entitled to a great education. Isn't it? So, I've been talking there a little bit about Victorian times, but one, of course, can't uh, gainsay the fact that these times, Victorian times, were very different to the 16th century and the 17th century, so far as the gradual development of the British Empire was concerned. The British Empire basically was a Victorian achievement. What went on before was not so glorious by any means. Merchant adventurers from all over Europe were grabbing and exploiting wherever they could in the whole world. But it was in these Victorian times that all this was pulled together and in a sense purified as far as was possible and this empire was created. At the same time, of course, the Industrial Revolution was gaining terrific momentum. So one can't also gainsay the fact that it was important that these territories all over the world, which were markets for manufactured products and also sources of raw material uh, were orderly, secure and not sources of trouble. This created, of course, uh, an economy which was, it seemed, unbreakable, unshakable, incredibly sound. At the same time, interestingly, it was an incredible age, the Victorian age. Because of the Industrial Revolution, there were crucial reforms taking place. It took time. At the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, the exploitation of British working people was just appalling, as many of you know. But gradually, great men stood up and fought for reform. The trades union movement began. People fought for it. But the great thing was they didn't fight physically. They fought with words. In the pubs, in public halls, no doubt in their families and so on. That's where they fought, with words. Sometimes there were brawls but brawls are nothing compared to a bloody revolution. And it was out of that that gradually the democratic system of this country was greatly polished, 
so that it could serve the people better and better. And the great freedoms, the freedom of speech, the freedom of worship, the freedom of a man or woman to do as they wish, provided they're not harming others, became more entrenched. They'd been fought for those freedoms, not just through the Industrial Revolution, but over hundreds and hundreds of years. But they were consolidated more. This was the achievement of the people, expressed through great, courageous people who stood up and fought for it and won. The sensei points out elsewhere in the poem too that the important constitutional first step was the breaking of the divine right of kings. That was, began to be broken when Charles I was beheaded and that process continued and was finally uh, completed really uh, in what was called the Bloodless Revolution of 1688. So why am I describing all this to you? I think the first reason is that you must understand that Sensei's view of history in this country is so extraordinarily correct. Secondly, perhaps, is to encourage myself and you all to study the history of our nation more and more and not just to gloss it over but to really try to understand one's roots and of course to realise more and more what a watershed the world wars were in the life of humanity and particularly of the countries of Europe finally of course World War II utterly exhausted us. You could see this clearly in the appeasement which we tried to achieve with Hitler in such a pathetic way uh, before World War II began. We had nothing. People had believed in unilateral disarmament. We had nothing. It was the most pathetic situation you could imagine. So Neville Chamberlain went off and came back with a totally false promise from Adolf Hitler, waving a bit of paper and thinking that he'd achieved peace. Of course he hadn't. It was hooey. But it shows you how weak by then we were. We were finding it difficult, of course, to hold the empire together. We hadn't got the funds the money, we hadn't got the security forces, and so on and so forth. So the World War II finally broke the backs of the British. And it really did break the backs of the British. And this is perhaps the most important reason of all for me to be talking as I'm talking now. Because after World War II, people in a general sense in this country, that would be uh, your mothers and fathers, probably, went through a period of extraordinary shame, a feeling of degradation. This is difficult to understand, but you must try to visualize the vastness of this empire which always surrounded everybody and which people served. The hugeness of it was disappearing in front of their eyes. So there was an anti-reaction. That reaction was to just shut off all thought about the past. This is what people did. They didn't want to look anymore. 
It was painful. Everything that people have been brought up with, the principles, the beliefs, the understandings have gone. And so in shutting it off, they not only shut it off from themselves, but they also shut it off from the generation which is to follow. The children born in the 50s and 60s. So as a result, uh, when I talk to people, one can feel this extraordinary gap. As if that was one world, and from 1945 onwards, there was another world. Total, often, lack of understanding. A total belief that everything that happened in this country before that time must have been wrong. That this was like some incredible punishment. People, of course, forgot that France, Germany, all the European nations, America, were suffering from a similar thing in a way, but none of it was like the suffering, I think, of the British. The pain of it. And this has had an effect. This feeling that there could have been nothing good in our past. People, if they talked about the past or past history, picked on the bad points. Searched, even, to find bad points about the leaders of the past, about any famous figure, and this tendency, you know, to search for something slanderous to say, and if you couldn't find it to make it up, began then in the 50s. That's where it all started. Uh, all we were swamped by was negativity. Truly, that was what the 1950s and the early 1960s, perhaps most of the 1960s, was like. But it began to change in the 60s because a new way of life was developing then. But still, the gap was there. Something rootless in a sense, yet people knew that there must be roots. And young people, I think, growing then, began to really think about searching for them. And I think that tendency is going on to this very day. It's extraordinary how we cling to negativity in Britain. If you take class warfare, class warfare in this day and age, in this particular year of 1987, is actually a dead duck, but it's kept alive by the politicians. They're the people who keep class warfare going. When you think about it deeply, I'm sure you'll come to realize that. There isn't any class warfare. In fact, these days, not in the terms of the traditional class warfare of the aristocracy, and those who work, or the upper middle class, and those who work. It's gone. It's a dead duck, like a dinosaur. The people I deal with in business you know, aren't those sort of people, people at the top of great companies and firms. It's all gone, but it's the politicians that keep it alive, polishing and scrubbing the old dinosaur because they haven't got anything else to think about. It makes me so angry sometimes. Anyway, finally, this nation, which, you know, 40 years previously had been so proud and great, just became filled with apathy, despair, targetless, rudderless, 
not knowing where we were going and through that uh, apathy of course inevitably led to outbreaks of violence alcoholism drug taking dissatisfaction and so on So, if you now turn back to the poem, then you can see what Sensei was trying to do for him. I would never have been sitting here telling you about my feelings about the history of this country unless that poem had been written. You would never have been here listening. Like me, you would have forgotten all about the bloodless revolution of 1688 and why it was important, and so on. Through writing this, he was saying, look, there's so much apathy in Britain today. There's so much suffering. I want to see you great. That's what he was saying. And this is what the qualities which before your people revealed. So therefore, inevitably, they must still be there deep in our lives. So why not set about revealing them again instead of only seeing the negative aspect of things? He's, he's giving a message of hope it's sort of sad in a way that we've got to have such a message of hope. And in SGI and in NSUK, probably, you know, we have the most hope of everyone in this country. But what about everybody else? So if we gradually live this poem in our own lives, in our own way, we can spread its message to others. Not in a preaching way, in our own individual way, inevitably, in a natural way, not through any uh, working out of plans, but just by talking to people, inevitably, the message of this poem will come through in the way which is best for us, individually, and the best for the person we're talking to, don't you think? And gradually, this message of hope, this reminder, if you like, will reach across the boundaries to everyone. This poem is not a poem for now. This poem is Sensei's eternal guidance for the people of this country. A hundred years, two hundred years' time, people will still be using this poem. I'm quite sure of that. Though, of course, history by that time will have advanced a great deal. But it will still serve as the derivation, if you like, from which the people of this country grew. I really feel he looks upon Britain, and he says it, as a barren garden garden in which there's no colour. But he's saying if you really look at yourselves and if you really see your greatness the, the good points, the great points and you work on it the Gohonzon will bring all these out again and the garden of Britain really will be filled with an incredible variety of beautiful flowers. Uh, today, too, these flowers will be many different colours. A garden which is filled with flowers all of the same colour has a sort of dullness. In the poem, he said, and standing quietly, an ancient castle. I can't help thinking of Taplow Court <laughs> when I read those lines. And when I first went to see Taplow Court, uh, before going to Japan at that time still the, the summer or the late summer flowers 
were blossoming. The, the, the flower beds were full of brilliant colours. Very beautiful it looked. Also, amazingly enough, Taplow Ridge, on which the house stands, knows the past. Taplow Ridge is probably better versed in British history than any of us too. What made us great? It wasn't the ancient Britons running about in woad. <laughs> Though they did something, of course. It was the Celts, the Romans, the Romans. Apparently, it was on Taplow Ridge, uh, in the area where the house is, that people formed up the local people to fight the legions of Julius Caesar. There, as I think I mentioned yesterday, in the grounds uh, is the burial mound of a great Saxon chief called Tapa. These were the people who made Britain. Celts, Romans, Saxons, Vikings, Normans. An amazing mixture, a cocktail of humanity. Hmm? Now we have another wonderful injection, as I said during summer courses, West Indians, Indians, Chinese, Pakistani, Africans, Southeast Asian, Japanese. This is treasure. We proved it in the past. <laughs> we'll discover it again now. They share our karma, otherwise they wouldn't be here, would they? It's not by chance that they're all here. And how wonderful that we can embrace them. And I believe as you read this poem, you realize that Sensei is hoping very much that we can set an example to the whole world of the way in which we can embrace people of every nationality in true Itai and create a wonderful example of Coast and Rufu in microcosm. Then, of course, the Buddha's land that we create <coughs> can never be destroyed like the British Empire was. <laughs>